This is a basic introductory guide to the aerodynamics of the 2022 Formula One regulations. The idea behind this video is to run through the regulations and how they can influence the aerodynamics. I will use the inherent advantages of CFD to give an insight into the flow fields and how interactions with the vehicle cause them. This I hope will give useful clues as to how teams are trying to manipulate the flow around the vehicles, but it won't explain why one team is faster than another. There are many reasons why these cars have the performance that they do. One aerodynamic reason is ground effects, which is highly dependent on the aerodynamic platform provided by the suspension. Just copying another car doesn't mean there is an automatic performance gain. I mean, no one would just copy another car. That would be daft, right? The model I'm using for this is my creation. There are a few mistakes in the model, but the fact that I'm hinting at the Ferrari is inconsequential. Aerodynamics F1 teams use are millimeter dependent, and I'm not trying to suggest that this model will come close to replicating actual performance parameters of real world cars. Its sole purpose is to illustrate approximate flow fields. So if changes to the car have an effect in this simulation, this effect should be still measurable and illustrative of a real world effect. So I'll start at the front and work my way back. The front wing is tightly regulated. It has a very specific volume that it can fit into, and everyone uses as much of it as they can. Restricted to a maximum of four elements, which must overlap each other as viewed from above, and their upper surface must have a positive angle. This prevents any part of the front wing creating downwash. It is positioned high off the ground and will therefore have very little ground effect. The end plates have a little bit of freedom, but only a little. Outwash is significantly curtailed, though teams have been seen working in this area and pushing the interpretations of the regulations. With the front wheel situated behind the end of the wings means that their aerodynamics are coupled. On this particular model, a very conservative model, most of the air impacting the wheel after the wing is pulled inboard. This tire squirt is something teams would want to control either by preventing negative downstream effects or even creating positive flow structures. The bodywork that wraps over and around the inside of the wheel is a specified shape that's primary purpose is to control the tire squirt and minimize the size of the wheel wake from these enormous wheels. The size of the turbulent wheel wake is actually very small and well controlled. There is a velocity magnitude slice taken just in front of the inlet to the floor that clearly shows a rotating mass of air. Seeding streamlines from this point and following them upstream illustrates nicely the wheel wake. This is actually the first important aspect of this car, as it is commonly thought that the floor fences are a primary component that prevents the tire weight from impacting the performance of the floor. Here these streamlines suggest that they aren't, and the wheel wake isn't going to affect the floor's performance at least from the front, but more evidence would be required to be sure. Just before the floor is addressed, the suspension have an important enough aerodynamic impact because they are in a sensitive airflow region. Thus it is seen as an area of aero development, though within tight dimensional constraints and symmetrical profiles for the suspension arms. The tendency is for them to be situated to redirect the upwash from the front wing downwards to benefit something downstream. Now we can get into the most important part of the car's aero, the floor. The entrance to the floor is volumetrically controlled by the regulations. It is allowed for up to four fences to be placed within the beginning of the floor. I have one to make it possible to better discern the actual impact of them, but this can be done later. This model has the floor's leading edge far back in the regulated volume, and in turn it is required to be relatively low. It is modelled this way because the Ferrari was the easiest to approximate. It was seen before that there is a suggestion that the wheel wake was not managed by the floor fences, so here would be more proof that they don't manage the turbulent air. Seating a bunch of streamlines in front of the floor's entrance would show where the flow comes from. As it turns out, the front wing's height seems to correspond remarkably with the air entering the floor. This suggests that the people who designed these regulations and set the height of the front wing did so with the intent that this is the volume of air that will be used by the floor. Out of all the streamlines, a single streamline has come from the front wheel's turbulent wake. So I can say the floor fences have very little, if not no function other than to control the volume of air entering the floor. Using these exact same seeds, we can see where that same air goes downstream. What is apparent is that the side pods are acting like barge boards and pushing the air wide, out and around the rear wheels. 
the air that enters the underfloor, even without the floor fences, has a large amount kicked out to the side. Some then re-enter the floor region before the rear wheels. The surface streamlines reflect this and illustrate why the floor edge has seen so many developments. Ideally, a mechanism that prevents this air entering the floor at the side would be sought. A problem area seen in this model with the streamlines is in the diffuser region, after the plank and between the rear wheels, shown as an amount of messy turbulent flow. Interestingly, if I remove a set of streamlines that corresponds to a horizontal line of seed points, they all have a contribution to this turbulence. As a general rule, this turbulent flow, particularly in the diffuser region, would want to be avoided, but it seems like there are many factors that would be impacting the performance of this flow region, and therefore there would be a complex array of solutions. I wouldn't be surprised if this is the region primarily responsible for the porpoising that plagues the field with this generation of car. While we are looking at this region of the diffuser, the wear plank that prevents the teams from running their cars on the ground stops in the diffuser, creating a bubble of separation that is seen clearly by the Walshier stress map as indicated by the low value purple patch. This unstable bubble is likely the reason that the streamline seated at the upper edge of the diffuser's exit has a couple of lines swapping sides. Cars are allowed to run vortex generators in this region after the plank to create a more stable flow and collapse this separation bubble into strings of stable vortices. The lastly, the key reason the current rules were created was to shrink the horizontal size of the car's wake to allow for the following car to run closer. Early indications are the cars are able to run close and pass more easily. Turning on all the streamlines, it is apparent that the shape of the flow behind the car caused by the aerodynamics is narrow. Even though there is some air pushed out beyond the rear wheels, it is pulled back in, around and up into the flow structure dominated by the rear wing. Again, this rear wing is heavily regulated for the purposes of pulling in and lifting up the car's wake. Typically and traditionally, rear wings are clearly delineated profiles with end plates. A wing profile without an end plate is very inefficient. This inefficiency is represented by the wingtip vortex. Adding more end plate generally increases the profile's lift efficiency. You'll never get back to the efficiency of an infinite wing, but here Formula 1 is kind of attempting this with a pseudo continuous profile. There are now just two trailing vortices created by the rear wing, billing up into its upwash. Overall, the dramatic rule change for the 2022 Formula 1 season are clearly deliberate in how each part of the car interacts with each other. Despite the fact that these cars are now ridiculously large, here is a car from 1990 for scale, they can be clearly raced with each other more closely and overtake more easily. This was the aim, and this video shows why it was successful.